All right, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. As you know, we're covering gavel to gavel, the Stephen Bourgoyne case. So this is where five 16-year-old children were killed on October 8, 2016. Burgoyne is charged with five counts of murder, aggravated operation of a motor vehicle, gross negligence. He's asserting the insanity defense. Guys, you may remember some of this testimony from the witnesses, some of whom are paraprofessionals from hospitals, police officers, firemen, as they were trying to help these kids. And then the defendant circles back after having stolen a police cruiser, and he gets into an accident a second time. Our very own Rachel Stockman breaks it down. After Stephen Burgoyne struck a car full of five teenagers driving the wrong way down the highway in Vermont, he was not done. Dash cam video shows Burgoyne stealing a police cruiser and fleeing the scene. In this portion, we've sped up for clarity. He stops, does a three-point turn, and drives back to the scene of the first crash. This video stops just before he causes a second massive crash. Eyewitnesses Keith Porter described leaping out of the way to avoid being hit by Burgoyne. I expected to not survive, and I laid down on the highway and kind of tried to dive towards the median and um, braced myself. Porter escaped with minor injuries. The jury next saw a dash cam video of the fiery wreckage of the second crash. Eyewitness Susan James described how the normally peaceful evening in the Vermont countryside transformed in an instant. I mean, it looked like a war zone. It looked like an Armageddon. It looked like, you know, things had blown up. Finally, the dash cam shows Burgoyne being treated by a doctor on the scene. Here, he even tries to escape. Burgoyne is finally detained and taken away handcuffed to a stretcher. This is Rachel Stockman reporting for the Long Crime Network. Well, if it weren't enough that we have the great Jean Rossi, we also have Paula Notari with us. She is a New York-based criminal defense attorney, former federal public defender. Paula, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, listen, let's, let's start with this uh, Burgoyne case. I mean... Um, I do criminal defense now, right? And they're asserting the insanity defense with this case. Uh, what are your thoughts with respect to this whole scene, the way it unfolded? I mean, the guy gets into an accident. He takes a police cruiser. He engages in a chase, circles back around again, crashes back into this car. And if you've been watching the testimony in this case, these witnesses, who many of whom are professionals, are unnerved about this. You hear these words being used like Armageddon and tires popping and being afraid that they were going to die and not knowing what was going on and cars exploding and being turned over. Crazy case, don't you think? Yeah, I think it's um, a really terrible, horrible case. One of probably the worst we see as criminal defense lawyers. And I think that, you know, the defense in these cases um, have an uphill battle because it's, it's, I think I read someplace in a case like this in virtually in the past 45 years, there's never been a successful insanity defense where there's murder. Um, it's so such a sad case. It's so tragic. And the, the prosecutor is going to have a real challenge here because, um, I mean, not the prosecutor, the defense lawyers, because the, the, the evidence is really uh, overwhelming that, that he uh, caused so much damage. And then he got in his car and he went back and he you know, again, hit the car uh, with the kids and the victims. And, and one of the big problems I see for the defense is the fact that hours before he was in the accident, that he did this, he was treated by uh, a physician's assistant. There were professionals who um, examined him and said that he appeared to uh, understand what was going on. And, and there was really no bizarre delusional behavior that the psychiatrists are talking about. So yeah. I think it's going to be extremely, extremely difficult yeah. for the defense. And Gene, to Paula's point, yeah. you know, there was there was this power of, you know, professionals that had evaluated him, and it could be a double-edged sword. She makes a very good point that they didn't see anything significant enough where they would have thought he was a danger to himself or others. But the defense is going to be arguing that he must have been suffering under some sort of mental disease or defect, at least at that point in time, that he felt he needed those services. So it kind of breaks both ways for the, for the lawyers in this case. Or do you see it predominating for one as opposed to the other? Oh, when he, when he got up and he uh, got into the car, is that it? No, no, when he went to see, seek out medical help prior to this incident. Oh, before the incident. Right. Yes, I think that absolutely helps the, gov uh, the, the uh, defense... It's not a home run, 
It's maybe a Texas single or stand-up double, but it does point towards insanity that he sought help before. It's like the other cases that we have been covering on insanity. Yeah, so, Paul, I want to just taking it one step further. So when you've represented people like this, um, as a prosecutor, I want to be showing all the goal-oriented behavior both before and afterwards. And some of that is... He had enough wherewithal to be able to flee. Flight is always something that I want to point to, that he recognized what he was doing was wrong, something that occurred was wrong. But in that state, the law is that, not that they didn't understand the difference between right or wrong, but they couldn't conform their conduct to the law, potentially. That's, it's a very loose standard, and it's by a preponderance of the evidence as opposed to clear and convincing evidence. So the state gives a lot of latitude to potentially make this insanity defense. But he also put his seatbelt on. He was able to drive the vehicle and he was able to get back to the scene. Are, what are you arguing as a defense lawyer to say, you know what, nevertheless, with all that goal-oriented behavior, he was out of his mind? Is the sheer carnage alone enough to say nobody but a crazy person would do this? Well, I think as a defense lawyer, the best thing that the defense lawyers have in this case is the fact that the state's prosecutor who first examined him actually came out on the side of the defense and said he was insane at the time of the offense, which is what we're talking about. We're talking about the time of the offense. So I would just really focus on that, those, that expert, the state's expert, who really supports the defense expert, and, and everything in that expert's report, and really defer to the fact that these are professionals and, and they know what's going on. But I think you're right, I, I, absolutely. Um, the good things for the prosecution here are, are the fact that, that uh, the, the day of, he went and saw, you know, he went to the hospital and he saw physicians and they could know, you know, best what was happening at the time of the offense because two hours before he was evaluated and, and the prosecutor is going to focus on the fact, of course, that, you know, he might have been malingering or um, making up uh, symptoms when he was evaluated by the two uh, forensic psychiatrists. Okay, Gene, so one of the points that Paul had just made, and, and boy, it was a really sophisticated evidentiary issue here, is that the yes. state's psychiatrist or psychologist yeah. comes up with an insanity, and I think me and you actually got on the phone one night, I was on my deck kind of hanging out there, you know, modulating this in my head as to whether or not in my state, and I started asking a lot of lawyers, can you call the, the witness for the other side and I think I'm coming down to the point where, even though I haven't done a full deep dive, and I'm sure each state is different, that if you identify that person as an expert in discovery, you suffer the risk they could be called. And that could be, to Paula's point, a devastating thing for the prosecution. Oh, I totally agree. And I just thought of this when Paul was, uh, good to meet you, Paula, when she was talking, that why not have your own expert look at all the facts including the report of their expert. And in their, in their conclusion, they talk about the underlying data they look at, looked at, and they could mention, oh, I saw a report that the government had on, on uh, Mr. Burgoyne. I just thought of that, and that's possible. Okay, listen, guys, with the technology that we have here, the big crystal ball of the computer in front of me, I'm gonna let you know from what I'm being told that the defense has rested with the exception of one possible defense witness that may be available tomorrow, the judge will allow them to reopen their case for that witness. Okay, and I'm also being told the state rebuttal witness is on now, so court is live. Let's go to it.